We live in a world in which I think courage is in far shorter supply than, uh, than genius. There, 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 is this, uh, you know, there is this very strange phenomenon in Silicon Valley where uh, so many of these successful companies were started by people who seem to be suffering from something like uh, Asperger's or something, something like this. And, and, um, and I think we need to always flip this around um, and, and, and see this as somewhat of an indictment of our, of our society where um, if you are not suffering from Asperger's, if you're actually socially relatively well adapted, um, you will somehow be talked out of or discouraged um, of any of the heterodox ideas you might have before they're even, uh, even fully formed. And so uh, you will sense that the ideas are too weird, they don't fit in, people will not like you, they won't be your friends, and, uh, and so you should, uh, you should not pursue them. Chris, thank you so much for that uh, phenomenal introduction, and uh, it's, a, it's really a tremendous honor and privilege to um, um, be here tonight to, to speak to you. I, I, uh, you know, I was, uh, when, I, when I started the Stanford Review back in, um, in, 2000, in 1987, we, uh, we sort of got this invitation to go to D.C. We met with all the uh, other editors of these college newspapers. And uh, we sort of realized that uh, even though we were kind of on our own, we were not totally on our own. And that's uh, and so it's you know it's 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 really tough to be a contrarian just by yourself. And it's it's always good to know that uh, that we're not completely completely isolated. And uh, it gave us uh, a lot of stamina as we uh, as we went through the years uh, to come. The debates over Western culture and political correctness and campus speech codes, in in one form in one form or another. And uh, you know, over the years, I've 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 really come to believe that the the greatest uh, political problem that we have is this problem of political correctness, uh, properly understood. And it is it is um, an unwillingness uh, to think for oneself, uh, a fear of um, of stepping outside of the bounds of uh, the, the sort of this incredible pressure to conform in in one way or another. And this is, I think, the the the, the core problem in our universities. And the uh, the core problem in our um, in our society at large, um, and I'll I'll talk about it a little bit tonight from a somewhat different perspective, from the perspective of science, technology, entrepreneurship, innovation, where I think many of these uh, themes um, are, are also reflected, in, um, and and uh, there's some parallels that are I think very uh, very important. <clears throat> so you know one of the, one of the challenges in teaching about entrepreneurship or teaching about how to uh, start new businesses is that there is there is actually no formula whatsoever. Uh, you know, science starts with the number two. Science starts with things that are repeatable, that are experimentally verifiable in one way or another. But uh, but I think that um, that all the really important things in our universe are singular, and that uh, um, every moment in the history of business, every moment in the history of technology, every moment in the history of our world happens only once. And, uh, and, so, uh, and so that uh, if you try to uh, turn history or uh, technology or business into some sort of a formula, um, um, that, will, that will not be a science, that will be a pseudoscience. Um, and, uh, and so it is this sort of non-repeatability, uh, this non-mechanistic non nature of, uh, of it that, that is, is the starting point of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of my book Zero to One, which is, the question about how, do, how does one create these singular, fantastic new businesses, fantastic new ventures that will, um, that will change the world. The, um, you know, the, the, the opening uh, sentence of uh, Tolstoy's Anna Karenina is, uh, all happy families are alike, all unhappy families are unhappy in their own special way. And I think, uh, I think the opposite is true of, of business. I think all happy companies are different because they uh, they came up with something that was um, different and unique from the rest of the world. They differentiated themselves from everybody else. Um, and, uh, and, the, uh, and the sort of politically incorrect word that I use to describe um, really great businesses is that they're monopolies. And this is, what, this is what you want to aim for. You don't want to be doing something that's interchangeable, where you could be replaced um, by, by lots of other people. Um, and uh, so as a founder, as an entrepreneur, you're always aiming for monopoly. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, um, all unhappy companies are alike.
because they fail to escape the essential sameness that is competition. Um, and, uh, and I think this is, uh, and so you do not want to be starting the fourth online pet food company or the tenth uh, thin film solar panel company or the, uh, and I'm, I'm always nervous about even raising this one in this context, but, or the 10,000th restaurant in Manhattan. Um, and, uh, and so if you, wanna, if you want a Darwinian competition, if you want nature bared red and tooth and claw, you should always open a restaurant. If you want to make money, you should do something, something very different. Um, the, uh, the Wall Street Journal excerpt of the chapter in my book, uh, All Happy Companies Are Different, uh, it, it sort of gets to, re you, and they sort of retitled it as uh, Competition is for Losers which is this uh, sort of has a sort of a much punchier ring to it. And, um, and, it's, uh, and it's extremely punchy because we always think of the losers as the people who are not good at competing. The losers are the people who somehow um, are not quite as good on the high school swim team or who don't get quite the um, high enough grades or test scores to get into, um, into the right uh, college. But I think, um, I think it is actually important to, to rethink this in some very, very deep ways. And when I, when I, if I had to sort of give advice to my younger self, uh, my teenage years, my, when I was in my 20s, um, you know, there was a way in which I was insanely tracked. I, I was not completely conformist since I did start one of these student newspapers and I did, you know, break from the herd in all sorts of ways. But it was still um, enormously tracked. My eighth grade yearbook, one of my friends wrote uh, in junior high school, I know you're gonna make it to Stanford in four years. I got into Stanford four years later. I went to Stanford Law School. I ended up at a big law firm here in Manhattan. It was on the outside. It was, um, it, was, uh, it was a place from the outside where everyone wanted to get in. On the inside, it was a place where everybody wanted to leave. Um, and, um, and you know, um, when, I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I left after seven months and three days, um, one, of the, um, one, of the, uh, one of the people, um, one of the people uh, down the hall from me said, uh, you know, I had no idea it was possible to escape from Alcatraz, which, which of course, um, which of course, um, was not literally true, since all you had to do was go out the front door and not come back. But, uh, but psychologically, this was not um, what uh, what people were capable of, because when uh, when their identity was defined by competing so intensely with uh, with other people, they uh, they could not imagine leaving. Um, and and this is, I think, the big problem with competition is that it focuses us on the people around us, and, um, and while we get better at the things we're competing on, we lose sight of anything that's important or transcendent or truly meaningful in our world. Um, and I think that's, that's what we need to always, always come back to. And so I, I like to sort of get at uh, this escape from competition, this move to monopoly, this move towards doing something where um, counterfactually, if you were not doing it, it wouldn't happen, something that's uh, through, through these sort of contrarian questions. The business one I like to always ask is, what great company is nobody building? The, the more intellectual one, which I like to ask, which I think is a fantastic interview question, is um, tell me something that's true that almost nobody agrees with you on. And, um, and this is a shockingly hard question for people to answer, um, even when they can read on the internet that I always ask the question. Um, and I, I think it's, and, and it's, it's, it's shockingly hard, in, in, um, people think it's shockingly hard because uh, you, you sort of hear the question and you think, well, you know, um, you know it's, it's just about, uh, you have to come with something really brilliant and incredibly smart and esoteric, and maybe you've had to spend 10 years in some postdoctoral program before you can find out something um, idiosyncratic that no one has ever thought of. But, um, but if we were really honest about it, most of us have some answers to this question. And, uh, and, and the actual reason that it's hard to answer is because um, in an interview context, the correct answer is one that the person asking the question is unlikely to agree with. And so the correct, and, and so, you know, answers like God does not exist, or, you know, even answers like the education system is screwed up. Uh, you know, the first one's untrue, the second one is true. Um, these, are, these are very sort of conventional answers, and, um, and, uh, and, and, um, and good answers are actually ones that are um, really uncomfortable. And we, we live in a world in which I think courage is in far shorter supply than, uh, than genius. There, 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 is this, uh, you know, there is this very strange phenomenon in Silicon Valley where uh, so many of these successful companies were started by people who seem to be suffering from something like uh, Asperger's or something, something like this. And, 
And, um, and I think we need to always flip this around um, and, and, and see this as somewhat of an indictment of our, of our society where um, if you are not suffering from Asperger's, if you're actually socially relatively well adapted, um, you will somehow be talked out of or discouraged um, of any of the heterodox ideas you might have before they're even, uh, even fully formed. And so uh, you will sense that the ideas are too weird, they don't fit in, people will not like you, they won't be your friends, and, uh, and so you should, uh, you should not pursue them. And uh, you know, uh, with apologies to people who went to uh, business school, uh, if you, um, you know, I often think of the business school demographic as people who are sort of the anti-Asperger's demographic. They're sort of socially very well adapted. They're often sort of low conviction um, in one way or another. Um, and you sort of put these people in a hothouse environment for two years. And uh, they've done studies on this. At the end of the two years, they always go into the wrong fields. They always sort of con convince one another to sort of try to catch the last wave. And so at Harvard Business School in 89, everyone tried to work for Michael Milken, you know, uh, sort of a year or two before he went to jail. They were never really interested in technology or Silicon Valley, except for 99, 2000, when they all flocked to Silicon Valley at the, at the very end of the dot-com bubble. Um, and on and on, and uh, and so I do think this uh, this um, this problem of um, of uh, of conformity is um, is a very deep uh, is a very deep problem. You know, it, it's um, it's already in the time of Shakespeare. The word ape meant both uh, primate and to imitate. And I would sort of then add the uh, the sort of the the pre um, uh, the, the sort of uh, the, the the other the Aristotelian uh, concept of biology would be that uh, man differs from the other animals in his greater aptitude for imitation. And so that, uh, and, and this is how we, you know, this is how we uh, learn languages, children, we imitate. This is how we, how culture gets transmitted. But then there are also all these ways that imitation can go very badly wrong. And it leads to crazed peer pressures. It leads to um, the various insane bubbles that we've experienced as a society. And, um, and I think that, uh, I think that uh, if there are going to, if there is going to be um, progress, if there is going to be new thinking in any direction, uh, it often uh, requires uh, uh, something that's uh, that's very different in nature. And uh, and there is, and there is this worry, of course, that our society has lost um, has lost sort of the transcendent reference points. And as we as we've lost these reference points, we've come to look more and more to one another, uh, and we've become somehow more. Um, sheep-like, more herd-like, more lemming-like. And, uh, and I think this is a, a very deep problem that one, one needs to think about, uh, one needs to think qu about quite a bit. Now, you know, on this, on this question of, of, um, of technology and, 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 and science, um, uh, I, th I think one of the, one of the big misconceptions, you know, one of the big misconceptions, I think it is, you know, I'm not a techno-utopian. I don't think technology is the panacea or the solution for all the world's problems. Um, I do think that it is one of the uh, great achievements of the West. Um, I think science, technology started in the West. There was something about Western civilization that en enabled them to happen. We can have debates as to exactly uh, what parts of the Western tradition uh, uh, really opened uh, it up to, to scientific and technological innovation. But I, I, I think it has something to do with the freedom of individuals to think for themselves and um, and um, and a way in which the, so, um, the, uh, the, the social conformity was not uh, quite so overwhelming. And, and I, I worry that we are, um, we are not uh, actually living in as much of a scientific and technological age as, uh, as is often advertised. Uh, if you, um, and you, know, you, can, you can look at this from the perspective of Washington, D.C. You can look at this from the perspective of Hollywood. Um, cert certainly uh, in, in, in the world of Washington, D.C., there are 535 congressmen and senators. I once did a study on this. By a generous count, maybe 35 of them had a background in science, engineering, or technology. The rest of them do not know that windmills do not work when the wind is not blowing, or that solar panels do not work at night. Um, and you're basically stuck in the Middle Ages in, 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 one, in one way or, or another. And, um, and, then, uh, and then from the perspective of, of Hollywood, um, uh, when we sort of think about what does the technological future look like, um, we are told it will be just catastrophic and dystopian in every way imaginable, and that uh, technology will destroy the world. And you can choose a future that looks um, at some combination of a Terminator movie or The Matrix or Avatar or Elysium. I watched the uh, Gravity movie about a year ago. 
and it was um, it was sort of this it's a sort of this uh, disaster in outer space and and you watch the movie you would never want to go into outer space you would be very happy to be back on some muddy tropical island and um, and and you know I I don't think it's I'm not even you know blaming Hollywood or DC altogether I think uh, they they both in, um, in many ways more reflect our society than they created they do both they both reflect and created but I think it's often more a reflection of this uh, of this um, of this sort of technological inertia in one way or another. Um, I think there's been, if we sort of look at the last um, a few decades, uh, 40, 50, you know, since the 70s, I, I think there has been, there has been enormous progress in uh, the world of computers, um, internet, mobile internet, um, the world of information technology, but there are many other areas where I think uh, things have uh, stalled rather badly, uh, if, we were, if we were to be honest about it. So, uh, and I think every, everything in the world of atoms rather than bits, has seen much less progress. And so, uh, so things that, and, and we don't even consider these to be technologies anymore, but the, the categories people would have talked about in the 1950s and 1960s, nuclear power, electricity too cheap to meter, uh, in Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace speech, 1954, um, that sort of uh, is, is off the agenda. Uh, supersonic travel, space uh, travel, underwater cities, uh, turning deserts into farmland or forests, uh, um, the green revolution and food innovation. Um, all these sorts of things have sort of uh, petered out in various ways. Uh, the, um, and as, as, we've, as, as um, biotechnology, medical technology, still progressing, but probably at a somewhat diminished rate. And, uh, and as these areas have failed, uh, they sort of, there's a certain hysteresis that kicks in where failure begets failure. And so when Nixon declared war on cancer in 1970 and promised we would defeat it by the bicentennial by 1976, 44 years later, um, maybe we're 44 years closer to the goal by definition, but there's a sense we're more than six years away. Uh, um, it would be inconceivable to declare war on Alzheimer's or dementia, even if you know one out of three people at age 85 suffer from it. Uh, and so there is sort of um, much less of, a, of an impetus for, uh, for these kinds of things in, in the society uh, we, we now live in. Um, people often ask, you know, why this is, why, why, has this, why has this happened? I always am nervous about answering questions that start with why, but I'll give, um, let me give both a libertarian and a, a, a conservative answer. You know, I think the, the libertarian answer is that we've basically outlawed everything in the world of atoms. We've left the world of bits relatively unregulated. It costs $100,000 to start a computer software company. It costs you a billion dollars to get a new drug approved through the FDA. And therefore, um, it's not surprising that we live in a world where people start more um, video game companies and uh, they don't actually work on uh, drugs that would uh, save people's lives. Um, and so I think there is sort of this, uh, this uh, there's sort of this, um, there's sort of this, uh, this extraordinary, uh, um, regulatory double standard, um, and then I think, um, and then I think from a, uh, I think from a, um, from a more uh, conservative perspective, there is, um, there is sort of the sense that we've, um, we've, you know, we've become a more risk-averse society. We, we, we don't, um, we, we, uh, we've lost, we've lost, uh, we've lost uh, hope for the future in all these, all these different ways, and. Uh, and I think this, um, and I think this has sort of seeped in in all these uh, subtle, different ways. You know, it's 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 a, uh, it's uh, we we there's there's a libertarian or conservative bias that the government can't do things, but uh, but I don't think this is absolutely true. You know, the government did succeed in um, the Manhattan Project in the 1940s. Um, it did succeed in Apollo. There was the SDI effort in the 80s, which I think would have actually succeeded had it been continued. You know, we would actually have lasers that could shoot down ICBMs today had we actually kept working on it. And, um, and, uh, and uh, we're now at a point where you can't even get a website for, uh, for, for Obamacare. And, um, and I, I think that, um, and you know, um, whatever, whatever, you, you know, whatever you think of the morality of nuclear weapons, I, I want to suggest that, uh, that, uh, that building an atomic bomb is a far harder uh, undertaking than building you know, building a uh, building an internet website, and so um, and so we should not let our ideological biases um, obscure the sort of objective decline that has happened. And I think, I think the universities have played a, a big role in this decline. Where where um, where uh, you know one of the ways that 
science happens is that it requires people to be um, somewhat idiosyncratic, eccentric thinkers of one sort or another. And uh, I think we've had sort of this Gresham's law at work, uh, sort of where the bad currency drives out the good. And the, um, the, the, the real scientists have been replaced by people who are nimble in the art of writing government grants um, and sort of these politicians disguised as scientists who are good at, uh, at collecting money from the government. I think it's like this problem that already exists in the time of Plato, you know, can the philosopher be a king? And the philosopher is interested in the truth, the king is interested in power. And I think uh, the, the sort of modern analog to that is, can a, a scientist be a good politician? And I think the answer is almost always no, because a scientist is interested in truth, and a politician is interested in getting money and lying about the truth. And, uh, and these two things are, are quite at odds. And so as science has become uh, politicized, and as you have sort of these grant writing uh, processes where you, um, you sort of apply for grants, uh, and you'll get a grant if everyone thinks your experiment will succeed, you end up only doing experiments that everyone thinks will work. The experiments always, they mostly work, um, but, uh, but uh, you never really push the envelope, you never really ask tough questions. And, uh, and so I think, you know, it's always easiest for us to see a lot of the conformity and political correctness in the humanities. The sciences are always sort of hard and esoteric, and so, you know, who's really to say that there's no progress in, you know, quantum computing or in string theory, that that's all just sort of a fraud or that, you know, all these other areas, genomics, all these other areas are kind of um, way overhyped. And it's, it's very hard because the uh, progress in all these areas is evaluated in, by this peer review methodology where people sort of, um, sort of uh, tell one another that all is well and everything is fantastic. And the public at large um, is told that it's too stupid to possibly understand what is going on. There are occasionally are some chinks in the armor. There's this very you know, disturbing set of studies where about half the articles uh, printed in Science and Nature magazines, the two leading uh, publications, involve experiments that cannot be repeated by anybody. Um, um, and I do think, uh, and I do think there's sort of an ideological version where there's certain certain areas of science that are just taboo. And so, if you're questioning Darwinism or if you're questioning uh, uh, climate change, uh, you always get in trouble. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and so there are all these areas that uh, where there's conformity. Um, one of my um, uh, one of uh, one of the people I know at Stanford uh, was a um, guy Bob Laughlin, who uh, is a professor in physics. He got a Nobel uh, Prize in physics. Uh, in the late 90s, and after he received his Nobel Prize, he suffered from the supreme delusion that he now had perfect academic freedom, and he could look into any subject matter whatsoever. And this, uh, this turned out to be a very, very big mistake. And uh, he decided to look into something far more controversial than questioning climate change or questioning Darwinism or you know, any, of, any sort of uh, uh, conventionally taboo topics. And he decided to look into the question of how many scientists, or so-called scientists, were fraudulently ripping the government off. <laughs> um, and um, and uh, needless to say, this was a movie that did not end well for, for, for him. Um, one, of my, one of my good friends, I sort of got the story from one of my good friends who uh, was a PhD student of Laughlin's at the time, and he'd come into their office once a week, and it would be, you know, of course he was like a somewhat stubborn, somewhat eccentric person who would tell his, his uh, grad students, you know, I'm so proud of you. You're on the front lines of science, and we're battling all the frauds and imposters, and we're like we're at war with the whole world to defend science from uh, from all these fraudulent people who are stealing money from the government. Um, they sort of had a public hearing where they uh, denounced some of the offending scientists. Um, uh, it sort of all went rather haywire. He was he was quite promptly defunded by the peer review process. His his grad students could no longer get PhDs because you can only get a PhD if you get some committee to approve of it, and um, and that's that's sort of that is sort of what happens. And so I think this uh, you know I I do think this problem of political correctness is this this very very broad problem that has you know that has many uh, that has many different facets to it, and that we we need to uh, think through uh, really really hard. Um, there is, you know, there's always a question, um, so the question is how, you know, how we, how we got here. There are questions, um, you know, how one, how one can sort of get out of this zone. Um, I think the, I think the, uh, the, 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 the sort of the, the core framework I want to leave you with, and then maybe just open up some, some questions, is that uh, I think the, you know, I think we are, we are in a world where, you know, a letter from an Einstein would get lost in the White House mailroom. There are all these things you could no longer, you could no longer do. Uh, you know, we, we, 
and I think you know the, the history about the stagnation, sclerosis of, of the United States, the conservative versus liberal debate is always when did this start? And, um, and I think the, you know, the liberals always say it started in the 80s with Reagan. The conservatives say it started in the 70s. And I think the conservatives are really right about that. And this is, this is why I think the 1970s were somehow an incredibly uh, pivotal decade in the history of this country. And we should never, um, we, we always have to insist on, on going back to the history of the 70s as a, as a key point of uh, departure of thinking through what, uh, what has gone uh, wrong or why, why things have sort of flattened out, not just in science and technology, but in so many other fields. Um, you know, it's, it's, we, we landed on the moon in July of 1969. Uh, Woodstock started uh, three weeks later. And I think with, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, we can say that that's when the hippies took over the country and when um, the true sort of cultural war over this question of progress was somehow, was somehow lost and the stagnation of the 70s, uh, the 70s really set in. And I think that uh, you know, if we are going to find a way back to the future, I think the first step, um, the first step um, is to realize that we've been wandering in a, in a desert for the last 40 years uh, and the first step to get out of the desert is to realize that we're in a desert and not in some sort of enchanted forest. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Peter. That was a terrific talk. And I've got about 65 questions, so it might be a, might be a long night. Uh, well, the first question, you don't have to answer this, but uh, would you invest in a startup founded by ISI students? <laughs> There's some, <laughs> I might see some folks here uh, soliciting uh, contributions tonight. Uh, the first question is, how do students in the humanities go zero to one if they're unlikely to become entrepreneurs? Well, that's always that's always a really, really tough question because um, because I I do think um, I do think there are many different kinds of things one can do. So I don't think the frontier is just around computers. I mean, I think there's sort of many uh, different kinds of new things one can do. One has to think through really hard um, where where to do it. Uh, I I do think um, I do think uh, you have to be uh, very uh, think really hard about whether to pursue a track. Within the university context, and I've you know I've I've spoken at great length in different contexts about the the corruption of of the university system. Uh, it's uh, and uh, and sort of you know if you if you pursue a degree in the humanities, you get a PhD in the humanities with the goal of getting a uh, a position at a at a at a university. Um, you know, I think this was a bad idea for conservatives already in the 80s. I suspect at this point it's even a bad idea for most liberals because I think I think most of the money is just being stolen by the administration. You know, even the you know there's sort of a certain sense of poetic justice where all the left-wing college professors are on minimum wage, um, but um, but uh, but there is this uh, there is this shocking uh, generational decline that uh, that has happened, um, and so I think uh, you know I I think there is um, in general there is no formula uh, that, that that we have anymore, and uh, and this is very disturbing because. Um, we've been brought up uh, in a set of formulas, and I think the millennial generation in the U.S. Uh, has been taught uh, to be tracked and to be uh, formula uh, in a formulaic way at a precise point when these formulas are breaking down. Uh, the analogy that I, I've used, and my apologies for repeating from earlier today, is that I, I think that um, the, uh, the universities face a crisis today comparable to the crisis the uh, Catholic Church faced uh, 500 years ago. Uh, and um, it's a, it's a single uh, uniform system. Uh, in, in a way, the universities were a successor. It's, uh, I, I think it's an atheist. You can sort of think of the universities as the atheist church. Um, there's, uh, there's less diversity than there was in the Catholic Church in 1514. So you had debates between the Dominicans and the Franciscans. Um, at this point, you have much smaller debates between you know, the Harvard and the Princeton uh, political science faculty. Um, but, um, but, um, but we have sort of this idea just like people had in 1514, uh, that um, the secular salvation requires you to be involved in these universities, that you go to Yale or you go to jail, that, uh, that, um, 
that you know um, that you have to pay more and more in indulgences to this sort of uh, priestly or prof professorial or really administrative class of people, and that uh, um, and that uh, you know if you get a diploma you'll be saved. If you do not get a diploma, uh, you will sort of go to the secular equivalent of, of hell. And um, and I think that uh, I think the uh, I think the future is going to is going to look somehow very different. And uh, it, it you know there. And we all have to think, you know, this is the disturbing message I have is similar to that of the 16th century reformers. You have to actually figure out how to save yourself to some extent because the institutions no longer are working. So the next question is, how was your contrarian attitude formed? What were the biggest influences on your thinking? Wow, this is always... I'm always, I'm always, um, I'm always hard, bad at answering these autobiographical questions. I think certainly, um, certainly there was, uh, you know, there was certainly. Uh, I grew up in a evangelical Christian um, family. There was, there was certainly the, uh, there was certainly sort of the, some of the political views I had didn't quite uh, fit into the the prevailing uh, liberal orthodoxy, and so, um, and so there was, um, there was an openness even as an undergraduate to thinking that not everything that I'd been told was. Uh, was being told not all the conventional truths were simply the truth. And I think this is always a very important starting point to, to, um, to, to not sort of think that, uh, that everything that uh, we're being taught is, is absolutely sacred in this, in this university context and to realize that there are um, there sort of are um, many ways in which even though we may have professors or people who are sort of much smarter or have higher IQs, they have themselves, um, they're themselves subject to the sort of social vortex where, um, where maybe, um, maybe they're not as objective about, about things as, as, the, as they might be. So I think there were sort of a whole bunch of different factors like this that, uh, that, uh, that came together. There's a number of questions about uh, Bitcoin and Apple Pay. So given your PayPal experience, and I don't know if you have any other investments in kind of the uh, new currency areas, but uh, just thoughts on, on alternatives to the US dollar. Well, there's, there's, uh, you know, there is sort of a, um, there are lots of problems with fiat money. Um, uh, the, uh, the challenge with creating alternatives to the U.S. dollar is that uh, most of the other currencies in the world today are probably even worse. So the euro seems worse, the yen seems worse, um, the ruble seems somewhat worse. Um, and, and then the question is whether you can, um, you know, whether you can create some, some new currencies um, wh where the government cannot simply inflate them away. Uh, and we certainly had this as an idea at PayPal. We had these uh, T-shirts back in 2000 where PayPal was going to be the new world currency. Uh, we, we didn't succeed at building a new currency. It's, um, we, uh, we did succeed at a new payment system, sort of a much lesser, lesser goal. Uh, the Bitcoin phenomenon is, is, very, um, is very interesting, and it has at least succeeded in creating a currency on the level of speculation. Uh, it's still... Uh, the, the critical challenge is to figure out ways to integrate that with uh, with with an actual payment system, and until that happens, you know it's it's um, it's very hard for things to change. Now, you know the one of the reasons why I think the dollar you know, money is always this the super mysterious thing. When I was, you know, when I was, um, you know, one one of the props I used at PayPal when I ran it was to always hold up a hundred dollar bill, and it, w it was sort of like this this almost hypnotic thing. You could get people's attention if you if you hold up money. You sort of ask. Why does this have value? What is it about this that actually has value? It's you know it's just a piece of paper. It's not very hygienic. It's dirty. You wouldn't has no use value. You wouldn't use it as wallpaper. You wouldn't want to use it as toilet paper. Um, and um, and and I think um, I think there's sort of all sorts of different. Um, it's very it's you know the more you think about it, the more mysterious it actually gets. Uh, what what money really is. Uh, one one thought on why it's quite hard to simply replace the dollar though is that. Uh, you know, it's, um, you know, it says, you know, it's, you know, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. And so you have public debts like taxes, and you need dollars to pay taxes. You can't have bitcoins to pay taxes. And if you don't use dollars to pay taxes, there will be people who will come with guns after you to make sure you pay your taxes in dollars. And so on some level, you know, the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency in the world, as imperfect as it is with fiat money and all, all, and, and all, all such, is you know it is driven by the supremacy of American military power, and uh, and until you until you um, you know I don't, I don't know if we should change that, but that's that is sort of what it's uh, what it's linked to on some deep level. 
And the last question we'll have to end with, if you could assign, it's also kind of one of these personal questions, but if you could assign one required great book for undergraduates, what would it be and why? You know, I think that's almost a, that's almost a self-contradictory question since, uh, since uh, you know, it, 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 I'm not, you'd probably just go with the Bible. You go with the Bible, but 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 if you if you went if you went if you went with sort of the University of Chicago, great it's always a great books tradition in, in the plural, and so somehow you're supposed to study these books in connection to one another, uh, and so uh, there there is some sense in which um, you're not uh, the the great books tradition is one where you try to read a, a whole number of them and see them as you know as connected to to one another, and so uh, so it's probably it's probably a mistake in that context to, to just read one, any one book.